Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Ian Trevoranis. I'll be your host today. With us also is Mark Bumiller. Mark is going to be giving us a presentation today about how we can better characterize our pigment and ink particles. So without further ado, please begin, Mark. Thank you. So uh, I just got back from vacation in Italy last week. I chose this shot because Ian and other people have told me I tend to have a big head sometimes around the office. Not true. I'm just a little guy in this picture. This is taken at, uh, now they call it Castle Sant'Angelo. It was really the uh, tomb that Hadrian had built for himself. You've probably heard of Hadrian's Wall in uh, the UK. But uh, I was visiting Rome, looking at a lot of marble, having a great time. Now it's back to work, where today we will be discussing uh, people who make pigments. What kind of particle characterization needs are there? Why do we do the measurements? And we'll give you some hints of uh, Perhaps, uh, why is particle size important to these kinds of samples? Uh, I did a study a few years ago of organic pigments using the LA950 laser diffraction analyzer. I'll show you that data. Some data we've collected through the years for inorganic pigments, uh, something about inks. Then we'll focus in on a specific pigment, titanium dioxide, which I suppose is the most broadly used pigment in the world. We'll show data for titanium dioxide from both laser diffraction and dynamic light scattering, where we'll look at particle size and zeta potential. And then we'll wrap up with our conclusions for today. So uh, let's define what pigments are. The pigments we're most interested in are materials that change the color of something. So pigments are there specifically so that our perception of a surface uh, becomes a certain hue, color, tint, opacity, brightness, etc. Um, so one way that pigments can change the colors that we see is that there is some kind of absorption reflective reflection going on as light interacts with a surface that has a pigment on it. So in the simple cartoon above, we have red, green, and blue. We have uh, broad spectrum light hitting a surface with a pigment. But specifically, more of the blue light reflects in the other wavelengths. And therefore, to the observer, this appears to be blue. Down below, we could show perhaps a little more in terms of looking at, uh, if we look at sunlight, which is a broad band across many wavelengths, as it interacts with a blue pigment, here at the surface would be absorption and then also reflection at certain, at certain wavelengths. And since we have absorption here and reflection here, this would create a blue appearance to the observer. So this is what pigments do. And many times pigments are particles and the size of the particle has a big impact on the color, brightness, hues, opacity, tint, etc. of the surface coated that we are looking at. So I'll show here some of the physical perceived properties and also how the material processes, depending on the particle size distribution of the pigments, these are specifically pigments made of particles for today's presentation. And they will change the hue and tint strength. Uh, can they, are they transparent or do they hide a surface underneath? Uh, how glossy is it? Is it glossy or is it flat? But then we also have to think about the processing of the material because these are powders, particles, like other particles in a chemical plant. And perhaps as you change the size and the zeta potential, they'll flocculate or aggregate at different degrees. If you reduce the particle size of particles in the suspension, you increase the viscosity. And perhaps that important is important if you're looking at making paints. Uh, the same issue with particle size and zeta potential, and this is very important, stability, the shelf life of the pigment in the paint could have a big impact on that. And we'll look at the effect of the distribution of particles and how that might affect stability. And either weather, even weather resistance will be affected by uh, the pigment particles. I was actually visiting a uh, paint company who's a customer in S S uh, Slovenia. And uh, they were actually showing they have this house inside this building where they paint it and then hit it with um, uh, wind and hit it with rain. And then they show the effect of different paints and how this will affect the weather resistance. Uh, the little chart over here is just a simple chart of showing uh, this is gloss strength versus uh, particle size expressed as a percent greater than one micron. So perhaps this would be one of the values we'd look at if we were using laser diffraction because we know as we uh, change this percent over one micron, the gloss changes significantly. So just a quick review of some of the physical properties that are dependent on the particle size and perhaps also 
particle, the zeta potential, since we're very small particles, that will affect the stability of a suspension. We'll start today when we start looking at case studies and applications with organic pigments, which are typically in the powder form. And uh, we have lots of customers who just use like an LA950 or maybe even an LA300. And I guess in this case for dry monitoring, it's always the LA950. But if you're doing dry milling and you want to measure it as a dry powder, you can just take the sample as you're milling it, bring it over to the instrument, perform a quick measurement, and find out when you've reached the end point of the desired particle size distribution as you do milling. Uh, if we're looking at powders that are dispersed in a liquid media, then we might be doing size, perhaps also zeta potential, although currently that might be a little more in research. But if we're looking at particles dispersed in a pigment, then perhaps we're doing wet measurements. And then we'll show you data four from the LA950, both measuring powders as dry powders and dispersed in liquids. So for organic pigments, there are lots of people using laser diffraction for these measurements. This is a study I did a few years ago where I should again thank the company Lasco Colors down in Warwick, Rhode Island, who I went down to visit one day and they were kind enough to give me these four organic pigments just to have fun with, you know, and I gave them the data afterwards, something we're always willing to do with customers who let us use the data. And I just took these four organic pigments, we measured them as a dry powder in the LA950, the instrument you see here, where the powder just feeds through the dry powder feeder through the system, we look at the light scattering, we calculate particle size. We're not going to cover that today. There are plenty of recorded webinars on the website talking about the technology. Today we're just going to talk about using this technique and what the data looks like. But I note down here how we made these measurements. We used uh, the small high, dis um, high dispersion nozzle. Uh, we looked at, we set up the instruments so that the automatic feedback loop continually kept a continuous mass flow rate of particles through the system by measuring the concentration of particles and changing the, the vibration rate as it looked at the concentration. A great unique feature of the dry powder feeder in the LA950. Uh, we kept the air pressure down fairly low for these samples. They're easy to disperse. And then we just loaded up enough, did three consecutive measurements, and then looked at the repeatability. Because when you use laser diffraction, that's the first thing you test to say, should I believe th these results, do I have confidence in them? As we look at the reproducibility of results, or repeatability, with powders it's always reproducibility. And that gives us some indication of what do we think of the data we generated. So now I'll show you some of these results. This is for this yellow pigment. What you see for each of these samples, we ran them three times. This is showing the median value of the three runs. We calculate the mean of the three runs and the coefficient of variation, which is just the standard deviation divided by the mean times 100. And what you'll see here is for this sample, we got the coefficient of variation down to about 1%. Uh, you see over here some tails. This could be sampling as much as anything else. Laser diffraction is inherently a very reproducible technique. For the next sample we ran, which was also a yellow, but a larger particle size, we actually see that we had better reproducibility, counterintuitive to what you would expect, but a coefficient of variation down at 0.4%. Excellent reproducibility for the sample. This is three runs overlaid. Uh, and then we ran another sample of a yellow pigment. Uh, again, the coefficient of variation down under a percent, close to 0.2 percent. And then a blue sample at about 25 microns, median particle size, and a coefficient of variation under 1 percent. So what you see here is just saying, you know, these are really easy samples. You load them on the tray of the dry powder feeder, set up, up to run automatically, take three measurements, it'll be incredibly reproducible. You can have a lot of confidence in these results. Very easy to set this up to run automatically. The operator just walks up to it, loads the sample, hits a button, and you can easily generate data like this for your organic powder pigments. Uh, we'll switch from organic pigments over to inorganic pigments because now I want to talk about taking powders and dispersing them in liquid. In terms of method development, this is a little more involved because we need to disperse the powder and then perhaps see if we need to use ultrasound to disperse it to primary particles. What we see here is this tail of large particles. This might indicate there's aggregates here. It could be that we'd want to spend a little more time on method development. To be honest, I ran these samples four years ago. I don't remember exactly how we did it. But this is a, a red iron oxide pigment. I think I ran for a study for samples used in the cosmetics industry. 
And what we're showing here is dispersed down to, what's the median size? That looks like it's down in the range of maybe 400 nanometers or so, 500 nanometers. Uh, laser diffraction is an incredibly flexible tool. It can measure up to millimeters down to the nanometer scale. But a fairly easy measurement of an inorganic red oxide. Uh, getting to smaller to a more controlled distribution here, this is chromium oxide green. And here I see that we noted we used a surfactant to wet the powder before we do the measurement. And then instead of dispersing it in DI water, we use sodium pyrophosphate. We have webinars on the website for method development where we'll talk about sampling and dispersion. We won't go into that today. But these are the kinds of things you need to do when working with taking a powder and dispersing it in liquid. You might need to do some method development looking at the proper concentration, in this case micro 90, and maybe instead of just dispersing in DI water, maybe we use some other ad agent to change the ionic uh, surface chemistry in the instrument while we're doing the measurement. And we see here a median down at 1.5 microns. Easy, easy stuff. Uh, we did a measurement of some aluminum oxide used as a pigment. And what you see here are, is a first peak down here at probably three, 400 nanometers. Uh, the median size here, it says right here, is 300 nanometers. But then maybe some aggregates, but we also just see this tail here. And so we took this sample, put it under a microscope, and it turned out that is just uh, a large particle. So it might not be the case where it's aggregated. Sometimes there are just large particles. But really to understand with laser diffraction, laser diffraction won't really tell you are these large particles or are these aggregates. That's usually when a microscope in your lab comes in very handy. Or an image analyzer like the PSA 300 where the image can actually give you a feel, aggregates versus just a few large particles. So we see here we used a different surfactant, uh, AGPAL 630 is a non-ionic surfactant we use for a lot of samples like this. We use ultrasound for 15 minutes. That's telling me this was an external ultrasonic probe. <clears throat> so again, these details are telling us there was method development required to get these results. But if we want to, t if you'd like to hear more about method development, uh, visit the website. We have various webinars devoted to that topic. Uh, in inks, there are pigments that actually are typically smaller than the other pigments we've seen so far. Uh, this was a pigment we just had from an um, inkjet hanging around the office somewhere, and we did measurements on the LA950. You see a median size here down at 105 nanometers. Now, not every laser diffraction analyzer is completely comfortable measuring it at 100 nanometers and below. So this is kind of showing off one of the capabilities of the LA950. It actually would be very comfortable measuring down to the 30 nanometer scale. But look at the repeatability here. Uh, this would be a coefficient of variation of like zero. So this is showing off how inherently repeatable laser diffraction is. This is taking the sample and recirculating it in the instrument, doing multiple measurements, and you'll see we get incredibly repeatable results, even for the sample. It's fairly small. Actually, sometimes smaller particles, once they're dispersed, are the most repeatable results you can see. But the LA950, very, very comfortable working down here in the nanometer scale. So now we're going to switch over to a very specific pigment, but probably the most used pigment, which is titanium dioxide. I think on the first slide here, I just show a commercial data sheet I just found on the web from what happens to just be a large chemical company. And uh, this is showing off uh, they manufacture the two different crystalline forms of titanium dioxide. This is the crystalline structure of anatase, TiO2. And this is the crystalline structure of rutile. And what, we're sh what they're showing here is two different grades of this titanium dioxide showing particle size as measured on the instrument. It seems they're using to do these measurements. That's not a uh, endorsement from this company. This is just pulled off. They put uh, that name right on all of the batches, of all of the products that they ship for TiO2 because I believe they use quite a few Hariba laser diffraction analyzers to keep track of the particle size of their titanium dioxide. Uh, they note down here that the lower median particle size and the more the narrow distribution as defined by the geometric standard deviation uh, makes this higher scattering efficiency essentially a better pigment for paint. Uh, it's in, 
interesting to note, they actually talk about the geometric standard deviation. So there are various ways you could define the breadth of this distribution. One of the calculations, which is standard in the LA950 software, is GSD, geometric standard deviation. And I've met several people, perhaps from this company, who say that, you know what, that's a really good indicator of the quality of the pigment going into a paint. And this will be a solid indicator of how well will this disperse as a function of time. So they really watch the GSD as they generate the titanium dioxide, and that generates a higher quality paint. So when we see some results later on for titanium dioxide, you'll probably see us reporting this value, the GSD, geometric standard deviation. Uh, just a few images of why particle size is so important. Uh, this is talking about relative scattering efficiency, scattering power. So in the previous slide, it mentioned this about the scattering efficiency as a function of size. Uh, so this is relative scattering power. This is particle size going at this is 100 nanometers. That's 200 nanometers. And this is saying this is actually also a function of the wavelength of light where you measure this with for red, green, and blue. But what you would see is for several wavelengths, there's this maximum right at around 220 nanometers. And that's one of the magic numbers for titanium dioxide. If you can get TiO2 dispersed so that the median particle size is 250 nanometers or a little under, that's just kind of a sweet spot where you maximize the scattering power and therefore is probably the, uh, the better pigment to use. If you want to just look at paint samples to see the effect of particle size, uh, these are samples of TiO2 paints sprayed onto a surface. Uh, here on the left we see the much whiter color. The median particle size was 0.25 microns, which is 250 nanometers. But if the particle size gets larger, you'll see it doesn't really look so white, does it? So the scattering power is not as high. And so this is just a visual way to understand, does, it, does particle size really matter? Oh, it certainly does. And for TiO2, this is where you'll see a lot of specifications for the pigment used for various applications, including paint. So if we talk about procedurally how one would go about measuring titanium dioxide, I already gave this away. The first thing you should do, of course, is buy a Hariba LA950. That is the instrument of choice for most large manufacturers of TiO2 with good reason. Uh, ease of use, dynamic range, uh, ability to measure down into this nanometer scale. Uh, you can decide, even with TiO2, even with small size distributions of TiO2, as you'll see in a few slides, you can still measure it either as a dry powder or disperse it in liquid. If we're going to disperse it in liquid, then we probably are going to do some method development looking at the proper surfactant and the right concentration of surfactants. Should we use ultrasound? I think somewhere on my computer I have a uh, published method for dispersing TiO2, and I think it uses PhotoFlow as the surfactant. Uh, sometimes, often it's dispersed in sodium hexametaphosphate, not just in DI water. And it is typically uh, dispersed using ultrasound, either an external probe or just the probe built into the LA950. So once we get the chemical nature of the method development organized, then we actually are going to, if it's a new product, do some method development in, with our hands on the instrument. And when we're doing this, if we're using the LA50, we could be using our method expert software features where we can automatically look at the effect of anything that might affect the result, such as the choice of refractive index. The concentration we measure at turns out to be fairly important for pigments. Pigments are one of the samples that are fairly sensitive to concentration. And it makes a lot of sense to measure these kind of samples at different percent transmissions, different concentrations, and look at the effect so that you design your method around an area that is most robust and reproducible. How much ultrasound should we use? Uh, this could also be automated using the Method Expert software. I'll show, I think, one slide from Method Expert in this talk, but if you want to hear more about this, again, that would be one of the other recorded webinars on method development. And if we're going to just measure it as a dry powder, typically we'll just use the smallest nozzle, so we have the highest efficiency for dispersion, and probably run up at the maximum air pressure, something up near 4 bar. But as I get 
started with a new sample like TiO2, one of the first things I might do is say, well, what should I use for refractive index? We should find a way to determine the real component, the refractive index. We will fix that, but then what should I use for the imaginary value? If you're not familiar with these terms, real refractive index imaginary, I think it was just a month ago we recorded a webinar on the effect of refractive index and how the selection of refractive index is automated using the method expert software in the LA950 software. What we do is we measure it once, fix the real value. Here we fix the real value, as you see, at 2.75. And then we varied the imaginary component. Here you see we varied it from 0 to 0 0.01, 0.1, 1, and 10. What the software will then do is it'll take the one file that has already been created during that initial measurement, and then it calculates the size distribution with these different values of refractive index. It shows you the calculated results here. <coughs> Down below here, you see D10, D50, D90 versus the R parameter. The R parameter is the value that tells us something about uh, the error calculation. So this is D10, D50, D90, sorry, as a function of refractive index. And this last graph is showing refractive index, the real is fixed, we're varying the imaginary from 0 up to 10. And this R parameter is an error calculation. And what you see is the error calculation minimizes when we choose an imaginary value of 1. Therefore, this is the imaginary value we will use for this pigment on the LA950. For this sample, and henceforward, we will use the refractive index of 2.75 for the real component and 1 for the imaginary. And this is all automated with the Method Expert software. And it really is an important decision that needs to be made, and it's a great way to automate that decision. So we've decided what we're going to do for refractive index. Um, this is TiO2 that we measured for a cosmetic study. And we see maybe there's still some aggregates. Uh, we certainly did do some method development, and we used ultrasound for this. You'll see there are particles below 0.1 micron, 100 nanometers. And in the cosmetics industry, there's an interest in this percent under 100, mic 100 nanometers because we could define these then as nanoparticles. Nanoparticles, something under 100 nanometers. And right in the LA950 software, we can present the percent under any diameter. In this case, the percent under 100 nanometers, and we see there's about 14.5% of the total under 100 nanometers. And this may be of interest to people. Uh, the particle size is important. Maybe they're trying to avoid nanoparticles. Maybe it's not important. I don't know. But the instrument's quite capable of measuring down in the size range and conveniently reporting it right here so that you know immediately what's percent under the size, 100 nanometers, or any other size you choose. You could tell what's percent over 1 micron. Remember on an earlier slide we saw that was important. We could add that as another value automatically reported each time we do this measurement. We had some customers send in some TiO2 uh, to the laboratory there in Irvine. And when we do method development, another way to make sure you're getting a good, dis good dispersion is it came in as a powder. You can measure it as a powder, as we see here with the red or red-orange distribution. And then we dispersed it and measured it as a liquid. And it just gives you that added confidence in your results. If you get similar results, measuring it both dry and dispersed as in a liquid, in this case it was in DI water. And let's just look at some of the values here. So if you look at the D50, the median for the dry dispersion, that's 0.346. And wet is 0.355. So those are pretty similar numbers. So that's pretty impressive. If you look at the median, there's only an 8 nanometer difference between these two. That's one impressive result we're looking at from this work, which was done by Kiwan there in our lab in Irvine. He was on his game this day. Uh, the other interesting thing we note here is a dry powder being able to disperse down at 350 nanometers. I'm not sure every instrument in the world can do that. In a tail down under 100 nanometers as a dry powder, I think we're seeing the, one of the reasons why people make TiO2 use Hariba instruments, because it generates data like this. Uh, we then were challenged by the customer to say, we have slight differences between these two samples. Can you pick up on it? So we have sample number one, and we have sample number two. 
Uh, we see this sample had a median of 0.334 and this 0.346. And it's a 12 nanometer difference, but it was very reproducible. So that's showing the ability to resolve these very small differences between particle size distributions using the LA950. So that is quite an instrument that can actually pick up differences in grades of finely dispersed TiO2 where there's only a 12 nanometer difference. So excellent data, excellent instrument. I think some of the last data we'll look at here is what happens when the particles are even smaller than down here on the 100 nanometer scale. Uh, this is actually data that was just published that I found published in an article. This is from a Hariba LB500 uh, several generations ago, but one of the Hariba dynamic light scattering instruments. I'm not sure exactly how you define nano TiO2. We'll just say it's small titanium dioxide. And what you see here, the median size, uh, here would probably really be talking about uh, maybe Z average, but it's down under 10 nanometers. So if your samples are all down to 10 nanometers and lower, then you're not going to be using laser diffraction, ours or anyone else's. You're probably going to be using dynamic light scattering. So for the, the smallest size distributions you see in the world of pigments, that's when we switch to dynamic light scattering. This was from an older model. But using our newer model, we can actually measure down here in the range of down to a nanometer. This particular sample, which I just ran a few weeks ago here in France, where I live, um, this was actually larger. This was up at 566 nanometers, but a very tight distribution. I was impressed by that. So here, if everything's under a micron, maybe we switch to using dynamic light scattering. And we have other presentations if you want to hear about Hariba in dynamic light scattering and the SZ100, which is our newer instrument for dynamic light scattering, that measures both particle size. And down here you see zeta potential for titanium dioxide. Uh, the pH is very important when we measure zeta potential. It's really a function of the surface chemistry of the sample as we measured it. So certainly for pigments, we always report the pH where the sample was taken. At pH 7, this titanium dioxide had a zeta potential of minus 48, pretty much where we would expect it to be. So this was just some samples came into the lab. Uh, we ran these here in France and did particle size very easily, measured the zeta potential. Uh, I will just point out, uh, if you send us samples for titanium dioxide and you want to know the zeta potential, please send it to us dispersed as you typically disperse it because, as I'd mentioned before, the zeta potential is this function of the overall surface chemistry. And if you disperse it with a certain surfactant and we disperse it a different way, we'll get a different answer, which may not be as meaningful to you if your goal is to find the best conditions for dispersing the sample. But if we do that, then we're happy to also show you what can be generated with our new DLS instrument, the SE100, measuring particle size down here in the sub micron range, even down to sub-nanometer for the most difficult samples. And we can also measure particle size. So, so far you've just heard kind of easy measurements. Uh, in general, the data we generated here uh, weren't all that hard to generate. Um, particle size is critical for this realm of uh, pigments. I will say I should be careful. You know, when you do the method development of pigments, the choice of refractive index is very important. The concentrations in this is important. The dispersion is important. So I shouldn't say they're the easiest samples out there. They really aren't. Uh, what I should say is if you understand method development, and we're very happy to help you get there, and you're using the right tool, such as the LA950, then you really would have both the instrument and the capability, as I make out here, and certainly with the support of the applications team, to generate the kind of data you saw here today, a very reproducible, data for pigments of various size ranges, very small up to larger, and with the new SC100, even down into that range of you think now you're down in the 10 nanometer range, 10 nanometers is not any challenge to the SC100 and smaller, and now we can do that work both for particle size and help you perhaps with the dispersion. Maybe you want to do an isoelectric point test of how does age potential change as a function of pH, uh, we have a webinar on doing those kinds of tests as well. And that could be used, for instance, for a formulator, looking at the best ways to create formulation of new pigments uh, used in paints or in other applications. So uh, you've, seen the you've seen the data that can be generated here. 
and uh, Ian, myself, Kiwan, Amy, the whole rest of the team are around to help walk you through these method development and dispersion challenges. Uh, we actually enjoy doing that. So uh, if uh, we do end up being your supplier for particle size, that's something we're very happy to help you with. So that is what we're going to cover today. Uh, there's a lot more always you can learn about. I mean, we have seminars on how does laser diffraction work, how do you do method development, the importance of refractive index, what about dynamic light scattering, what about zeta potential. If you go onto the website, and this will bring you to the particle characterization segment of the Hariba website, uh, this is where you'll go. Uh, if you want to get to the most interesting information, you need to go into the download center where you need to register once. But once you get into this download center, then you can actually get into the application notes. And for instance, I just put this on here. There's an application note uh, I just wrote maybe a month ago on uh, this titanium dioxide data we showed you that Kiwan generated the data for. Uh, you'll see an application note just on organic pigments, you'll see one just on inks, you'll see one just on isoelectric points. So lots of information here, probably 130 application technical notes uh, here from Ian. We're up to 50 webinars. I'm in the middle of writing the next white paper on new Zeta potential standards. That should be ready by Friday, I hope. So if you need additional information on this subject or others, this is where you would go to get it. So that's the information I presented here today. Time to thank everyone for joining us. And uh, now we could uh, open the uh, forum up to see if any questions came up along the way. All right, thanks very much, Mark. Is Ian still here? There he is. So as Mark was saying, thank you very much for, uh, for attending the formal presentation. We'll have a short Q&A session now. We have uh, one or two questions that have come in already. If you have anything, go ahead and go down to the chat box and type it in. Uh, I've posted the webinar slides, or the uh, URL where you can download today's slides, in the chat box a few times. If you haven't seen it yet, I will repost it once more. And the uh, last thing I'll say is, if you're going to leave, uh, or when you do leave the webinar, you'll be presented with a, uh, uh, a short survey that's completely optional, but if you would take it, that would mean a lot to us. We look at all of the survey responses, and uh, we do make changes based on how we present the webinars and uh, so on and so forth. And inside each of those surveys is a question, too, about whether or not you'd be willing to provide data for use in a Hariba webinar or perhaps present a webinar yourself. Uh, and we have started following up with the folks who say yes to that. So now onto the questions. Uh, Mark, a different Mark than the presenter, is asking, uh, during the grind state, will TiO2 particle size change? How can we correlate the change with temperature change? So two questions there. I'm not quite sure what he means by grind state. Maybe he just means while it's being ground. Well, they go through the milling process, yeah. So I have data on my computer of milling of other pigments. I don't think I have it for TiO2 here. So um, the large customers who use our instruments are fairly cautious with the data they show us, and we're also cautious with what we share publicly. So I'm racking my brains, and I don't have any such data customers have ever shared with me. I've seen data where, you know, they have to keep adding surfactant so that you keep coating new surface area as it's ground. But I've never seen any data on the effect of temperature. So that is actually something where I'm just going to admit I haven't seen that data. So um, I would check with some perhaps consultants. Ian might know someone too where he could say, do you have any data on that? But I don't have it at my fingertips, I'm afraid. Yeah, so uh, Mark, I'll make a note and I'll follow up with you in a separate email. Uh, we do have a relationship with one or two consultants in the paint and pigments industry. And uh, people who have formerly worked for TIO2 suppliers, they might have something interesting to share with you. So I'll follow up with a separate email. And I learned a long time ago to never admit to things that I don't know anything about. I gave a webinar on um, this could, the, attempt, the effect of particle size on rheology. And someone asked about temperature, and it was uh, this one equation, the uh, Krieger-Darty equation, is used to relate particle size to viscosity.
And in a previous slide, I said, well, everyone uses Krieg or Doherty, but I've never seen the temperature dependence, so I'll admit I don't know it. And at the end, I got an email from Professor Krieger, who was attending, <laughs> who said, thanks for showing my equation, and this is the answer, but that's why you never try to say you know things you don't know. You never know who's out there. <laughs> well, good thing for us, Gustav Me has long since passed. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Yvonne is asking, how important is sonication? Is it a must to use? And uh, Oh, yeah. For most pigments, oh, yeah. Um, and sometimes you just hit it with 20 seconds in the LA950. Sometimes it's 10 minutes on an external probe. Uh, it's always sample dependent, but when I'm trying to disperse TiO2, I'm always using ultrasound just to say, are these aggregated? Does this need some more help? Uh, how often do you use ultrasound on these samples, Ian? Uh, for this particular application, almost always, unless there's some value to be gained by knowing what the uh, agglomerated state is. Otherwise, it's for, for something like this, yeah, almost all the time. Which, you know, in my mind is probably 95% of the time. Mm -hmm. Well, you always test it. You might decide you don't need it, but you're always going to test it. So Yvonne has followed up and said that uh, in their situation, they find it often creates foam or bubbles. And that's, you know, that's typical. It, uh, it depends on the surfactant you use. Uh, some surfactants tend to foam up much more quickly than others. Uh, so you have to find a, a sweet spot. You know, the, uh, the most challenging surfactant application we know about involves uh, some commercial shampoo and the amount of surfactant used in the measurement protocol is so high that it's almost impossible not to create a bunch of foam and a bunch of bubbles. Uh, and in that case, there are different techniques to manage it. Uh, and if you're curious, Yvonne, uh, feel free to email me, and I can share some of those techniques with you. I'm putting my email address in the chat box right now. But, um, yeah, just different management techniques or you could choose a different surfactant that maybe foams less. Uh, recently yeah, in our drop the concentration way down in the measurement while you're doing the measurement anyway. Yeah. All right. Uh, we have another question. So back to the TiO2 slide showing the two different pigment batches. Would you please comment about the small difference in particle size difference? And how would you distinguish that as being real when considering standard deviation of such distribution measurements? Sure. So this is dry analysis of the two different batches. And uh, this was run in Irvine. Kiwan really looked at the reproducibility. Isn't that how we convinced everyone this was real data, Ian? Yeah, that's right. So there's repeatability and reproducibility. And with a, a dry measurement, what we would do is we take a single sampling, let's say, so however the material got to us, you know, whether we scoop feed it or um, put it onto a spinning riffle or some better sampling mechanism, we would take a sampling, put it on the powder jet chute, and do, let's say, three to five measurements in a row. And then we might take a second sampling and take another three to five measurements. And how well each of those individual sets of data overlay tells us something about uh, repeatability in this case. And then comparing, overlaying the two different sets, which is what we're doing here, uh, tells us a little bit something about whether or not those results are reliable. I'm not sure I explained that in the clearest possible way. So with laser diffraction, when you're going through your method development, you design for repeatability or reproducibility. With powders, you only have reproducibility because every time you do the measurement, it's destructive. So take the two samples. Uh, take sample A and see how repeatable it is. Take reproducible. Compare that to then your method for sample B. And then take the mean values from those multiple measurements, and they really have to always be different to convince yourself you're seeing a difference between the samples and not drift in the instrument. Well, I hope that's clear, which, Yvonne. Which in this case, we saw that it was real differences in the two batches. Mm -hmm. If that wasn't clear, though, uh, go ahead and send me an email again, and we can continue the discussion further offline.
Oh, um, we should drag Kiwon into this soon. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I didn't mean me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> of course. Uh, no, it's it's a it's an excellent question actually, and uh, it shows good understanding of yeah, <laughs> what some manufacturers might try and do to pull the wool over your eyes. So uh, Mark is asking, how can we be sure that the ultrasound function works on an analyzer? And the uh, the very easy answer to that is simply run a NIST traceable particle size standard. So uh, we choose to use glass bead standards from a manufacturer called White House Scientific. If you weren't sure that the ultrasonic probe was working, we have a, uh, an analytical test method that we use to run this certain material. It's called PS202, and it has a, a nominal size range of 3 to 30 microns. And if you don't get, after following our test procedure, the... Uh, results that uh, we should be getting for D10, D50, D90, then something isn't right. It could be that your ultrasonic probe isn't working correctly. It could be something else. But that's how you would do it. Yeah, unfortunately, there's no way to calibrate these ultrasonic probes. The only way to really test um, does it have the MG now it used to have would be you'd have to do it when it first showed up is you just turn it on for a certain period of time, maybe 10 minutes, and you look at the t increase in temperature. So you need a uh, very sensitive thermometer, and you need to do it when the unit first shows up. And say, if I leave the probe on for 10 minutes, it raises so many percentages of a degree or one degree. And then maybe once a year, you just go back and you turn on your probe full power for the same time period and make sure you see the temperature difference. So that's the only way I know physically to test this that does not require the measurement of particles. But as Ian described, that particular sample needs ultrasound to disperse it to get the answer we expect. And if you're not getting the power you should be getting out of your probe, then you won't get that expected result. That's the other way to test it. So we have a question to explain what geometric standard deviation, or as we were calling it, GSD. And um, we actually have the equation in one of our boot camp presentations that I'm looking for real quickly uh, so that I can refer you to the right presentation on our website. But real quickly, the real reason we talk about geometric standard deviation in the context of paints and pigments is simply, be here. is simply because um, a bunch of fairly intelligent people got together and decided that geometric standard deviation does a good job of describing the shape of the distribution. And with pigments, that's very important, right? Uh, in, in a total vacuum of any other information, almost every particle size analyzer manufacturer would say you want to look at the D10, D50, and D90 because that does a reasonable job, reasonable job of reducing all of the information in a particle size distribution and do a few actionable metrics. For the uh, pigments folks, especially the TiO2 folks, D10, D50, D90 didn't give them all of the information they needed to make the best choices. So then they looked at geometric standard deviation as a way of helping to quantify how much of a tail extended above some critical size. So you see in the slide Mark showing right now, the TiO2 has a coarse tail that looks a little bit different than the fine tail, right? So GSD just helps describe the shape of the distribution without actually having to look at the distribution. And these two numbers are different, 1.92, 1.86. So those are the kind of numbers they look at. You know, how do you define the distribution of anything? Is there a standard calculation, standard deviation? And then there's a different way to do the calculation for GSD, and I'd be like Ian. I'd go look for the equation on uh, either the boot camp slide, or it is also probably in the um, uh, basic principles uh, book. There's also the technical note on all of the calculations, right? So it shows up in three different places on the web. Uh, there is a technical note on the calculations that come out on the 950. There is a boot camp web, uh, webinar. And then also uh, inside the um, basic principles uh, document, which you can view or download, the discussion is also in there. So I don't know where they are. I just don't keep it memorized. I went to a school where we had open book tests in our major every single test all four years. So. I always got used to the idea, if I can find the equation, I'm okay, I don't have to remember it. That's my excuse, Ian. What's yours? Um, I don't have an excuse. I have, I have uh, 
an elephant's memory. It's in the Introduction to Particle Size Basics webinar, which is on uh, our website, coded as TR001. I just put that information into the chat box, and I can tell you the exact slide it's on. It's on slide 26, and that is also now in the chat box. So again, to find the webinars that we record, just go to hariba.com slash particle. Click on the Download Center, and uh, you'll, you'll have to register if you haven't already. But once that's complete and you're logged in, you can go to the Webinars area of the Download Center, and then just look for TR001. Uh, you can look at either the video or the slides. But that's just if you really need to know how the equation works. Uh, the, the practical use of it, the pragmatic use of it, is, is what I've described. Yeah, and that's come at us from both customers and the consultant we use. That seems to be a number they really focus in on. Uh, so Luis has asked a question that I'm not sure I understand. He's asking, what happened with the two samples in the dry analysis? What was the difference? Oh, I think we've already perhaps answered that question. And uh, it's hard for us to say what caused the different particle sizes. These are probably the, uh, the overlaid... TIO2 results. Uh, hard for us to say what changed the uh, particle size distribution in the two different lots. Uh, it could be grinding efficiencies, could be, I don't know, just different operators, bad day, Correct. something. Concentration, who knows. Usually people don't share the processing information with us. That's usually something they're guarded about. Yeah, we usually, when people send in two different lots of the same material, it's for one of two purposes. They either expect that there has been a change because they have some other indicator that says that one is a bad batch and one is a good batch, or they're exactly the same batch and they're trying to test the <laughs> trying trying to test our <laughs> our ethical boundaries. <laughs> but uh, anyway, that seems to be the last question. Uh, once again, if you think of anything, my email address is going back into the chat box now. Uh, so feel free to email me. Any questions you have? Oh, I put Mark's email address. Oh, my mistake. So okay, I answered my email too. <laughs> when, when he's not vacationing in Italy. <laughs> I am going to work out of my home on Thursday and Friday. Uh, all right. Well, thank you all for <laughs> attending. And once again, if you, uh, if you have three to five minutes to complete the survey that you're going to see, please do so. It's very valuable information for us. Hope you yeah, all have everybody today. Yeah, hope you all have a good rest of the day. Bye everyone. Ciao, bye.